To some, he was one of America's greatest heroes, a man who had helped open a vast continent for settlement. Kit Carson was this larger-than-life figure that represented freedom and independence and adventure. It was the cowboy mythology and the cowboy ethic long before that had even been thought of. To others, he was a villain who waged a merciless campaign against one of the great native tribes of the West. My great-grandfather lies buried in Bosco Redondo uh, because of him. In the end, his contradictions would define his legacy and tell the true story of how the West was won. He represented his country, and he represented what America was becoming. And so when we look at Kit Carson, if we get uncomfortable, well, that's because we're looking in the mirror and we're seeing ourselves. Early in the fall of 1862, a military courier made his way south from Santa Fe to the U.S. Army post at Fort Stanton with a dispatch addressed to Colonel Christopher Carson. At 52, Kit Carson was one of the most famous Americans of his time. When the West was still a mystery to most of his countrymen, he had been the one to master it. Few white men knew the vast Western landscape as intimately or understood the ways of its native peoples so well. He was the brave and loyal guide who had marked out a path for the westward going nation, the sought after Indian tracker who could follow any trail, the fearless warrior portrayed in dozens of best selling books. Now he had been chosen to lead an historic military campaign, one that would force New Mexico's most formidable tribes into submission remove them to a reservation and clear the way for American settlement. As a clerk read the dispatch aloud, Carson listened with mounting dismay. All Indian men are to be killed wherever you find them. The women and children will not be harmed, but you'll take them prisoners until you receive other instructions about them. Carson had never before defied an order. His sense of honor would not allow for it. But duty in this case seemed dishonorable as well. To carry out the task now given him, Carson would have to destroy an entire way of life. The very one that had made him who he was. Kit Carson lived in a world in which there weren't a lot of good choices often and he tried to navigate it as best he could, true to his own lights. And in some instances, that led him to moments of great heroism. And in some instances, that led him to moments that he will forever be reviled for. As a young man, Kit Carson had been sure of two things. He would not make his life in Missouri the way his father had done, and he would not earn his living making saddles as his mother had hoped. He was just 16 and a bit shorter than average. He had no money, few prospects, and so little education that he couldn't even write his own name. But he was tough. He knew how to handle a rifle, he figured that and a horse would take him anywhere he wanted to go. The year was 1826, 
and Missouri was then the vanguard of American settlement. Beyond its border lay another world. Just five years earlier, merchants had opened the Santa Fe Trail, an international trading route that ran southwest from Missouri nearly 900 miles and linked America's frontier to Mexico's. Carson had been itching to hit the road almost ever since. The West offers boundless opportunity, the freedom from all the restraints of family, all the restraints of a shopkeeper's life, and of course, the promise of adventure, of danger, of excitement. And so he runs away. He does a Huck Finn and lights out for the territories. He wound up in Taos, a small high desert settlement in the far corner of the Mexican frontier that for nearly a quarter century had been the hub of the southwestern fur trade. When he arrived in early winter, the place was teeming with trappers, Americans, Frenchmen, Canadians all of them scruffy and sunburned after months spent pulling beaver from the rivers of the Rockies. With their furs now sold, soon to be turned into fashionable hats back in the East, they frittered their days away, playing cards, telling tales, and tossing back a local moonshine called Taos Lightning. Carson wanted to be a part of this fraternity of men, and these greasy, grizzled, hairy, often drunk, international cast of characters who knew the rivers of the West and had been to all these amazing places. Uh, he wanted to be one of these guys as quickly as they'd have him. Over the next two years, Carson worked as a cook and a hunter in Taos, and then, having learned Spanish, as an interpreter for a merchant caravan. Finally, in the spring of 1829, when he was 19, he was hired as a trapper on an expedition to the untapped tributaries of the Gila River. He was the greenhorn among some 40 seasoned mountain men, deep in the wilderness on Mexican soil and surrounded by hostile Apaches. They would frequently of night crawl into our camp, Carson remembered. They would steal a trap, kill a mule or horse, and endeavor to do what damage they could. In a world populated almost exclusively by Native Americans, the trapper's best chance at survival was to act as if they were just another tribe. The mountain men were very practical people. They had a job to do and they had to go into these dangerous areas then extract a commodity. So they formed all kinds of alliances with American Indians and found that it was practical to live more like an American Indian than like a, like a a Frenchman or or uh, Anglo-American. Carson acquired a good many skills from the Indians and uh, an attitude as well, a, a way of thinking of the world around them. I think he adopted a large part of that and it became um, inseparable with his personality. He understood what was expected of him by native peoples that he came in contact with in terms of peaceful relationships and trade relationships, but also in terms of conflict. And he understood that retribution must follow crime and follow it immediately and harshly if one was to survive in this environment. On one occasion, while trapping on the North Fork of the Missouri River, Carson and his companions came in sight of a large encampment of Blackfeet a tribe that had attacked them at every opportunity for several seasons past. As Carson recalled it, we were determined to try our strength to discover who had right to the country. Catching the Blackfeet off guard, the trappers charged the village, firing as they went. It was the prettiest fight I ever saw, Carson said later. After three hours, we finally routed them and took several scouts. This ended our difficulties with the Blackfeet. Whatever situation he was in, uh, would he negotiate? Would he fight? Would he bluff? 
based on knowledge that he had of the specific tribe and sometimes a sub-tribe within the tribe. Um, it was not a monolithic situation, the American Indian. He didn't live that way, and, and nor did many of the, of the mountain men. Their experience was much more informed by practical considerations of how to get along day to day. In time, Carson became what Americans of his generation might have called a white Indian. He mastered the universal sign language used by the Western tribes and acquired a working knowledge of more than a half dozen Indian tongues. He dressed in buckskins, slept on buffalo robes, dined on buffalo jerky. And when he was 25, he took an Indian wife, an Arapaho named Singing Grass, offering her father a bride price of five blankets, three mules, and a gun. Like many of the trappers, Carson settled down with the American Indian woman. He found that this marriage was certainly a marriage of convenience in the sense that he had someone on the trail with him who helped do all the thousand and one tasks that had to be done. But it was the first love of his life. He was devoted to her. Not long after they were married, Carson gave Singing Grass a gift of glass beads an item highly prized among the Arapahoes as decoration for their moccasins. She was a good wife to me, he told a friend years later. I never came in from hunting that she didn't have warm water ready for my cold feet. Carson and Singing Grass would have two daughters together. Only one, Adeline, would survive early childhood. And the birth of the second in 1839 would claim Singing Grass's life. By then, the era of the mountain man was coming to an end. Just as decades of over-trapping took their toll and the beaver grew scarce, the fashion shifted to hats of silk. Within a year, the market had collapsed and Carson suddenly found himself out of work, widowed, and shouldering the burdens of parenthood alone. He was 29. Another man might have headed back to the place he had come from. Carson decided to stay. You know, he knows that there's this whole life that is going on back east that he left. And he's got a curiosity about it. But I think he knows that's not a world that he can operate in successfully. He knows the West, he loves the West, and this is his world, this is his life. He has become a Westerner. The West is where races intersect, cultures intersect, sometimes violently, more often not. Kit Carson moves easily in that world. He's not opposed to confronting people straight on and engaging in combat, taking a scalp, if need be, to make a point. But that doesn't mean he couldn't sit down and break bread the very next week. In May 1842, Two years after the fur trade went bust, Carson was heading up the Missouri River from St. Louis, having just brought his daughter Adeline to be educated in the East. He was on his way back to Taos, his pockets all but empty and his future uncertain, when he struck up a conversation with a young army lieutenant who introduced himself as John C. Fremont. Fremont was about to embark on an expedition to survey and map the West, and he had yet to hire a guide. Carson saw an opportunity. After more than 10 years as a trapper, there was no trail he hadn't traveled, no wilderness challenge he couldn't meet. But his pitch to Fremont was characteristically modest. I informed him that I'd been some time in the mountains, Carson later recalled, and I thought I could guide him to any point he would wish to go. 
Fremont's suspicious at first. He says, I don't know about this guy, you know. For one thing, Carson was not physically impressive. He doesn't look like a rugged outdoorsman. He was a short little guy. He was kind of self-effacing and understated, but had this reputation for being quite capable. And Fremont hired him on the spot. In early June, Carson and Fremont set out from St. Louis with a party of 25 men. Their mission was to map the first leg of an overland route to the Pacific. A route that had been discovered some 30 years before, but virtually unused by anyone but fur trappers and Indians ever since. A route that soon would be called the Oregon Trail. The expedition had been sponsored by the federal government at the urging of Fremont's father-in-law, U.S. Senator Thomas Hart Benton, one of America's most zealous promoters of Western expansion. Benton saw early on the importance of America being a continental nation, having ports on the Pacific, and having all the land in between. He also understood that before this could happen, uh, the United States needed to understand this land. Carson likely did not realize it, but he'd signed on to the most ambitious political enterprise of the 19th century. A project that would come to be known as Manifest Destiny. Carson, he's right on the cutting edge of this movement. This idea that God or nature or whatever one wants to call it is going to open up the West for the American Republic, going to make the West the empire of liberty. With Carson in the lead, and a dozen wagons worth of equipment and scientific instruments in tow. Fremont's party covered some 1,200 miles that summer, moving steadily westward along the Platte and the North Platte, through the present-day states of Kansas and Nebraska, and up into the Rockies as far as South Pass, the broad valley that cut through the mountains and separated the first leg of the trail from the second. The next summer, they returned to complete the route, following the trail west across Mexico's frontier to the Pacific, then turning south and continuing on, over the Sierra Nevada in the dead of winter, down into Alta California, and across the Mojave Desert, before finally winding back around to the southern Rockies. By then, they had surveyed nearly 5,000 miles, and Fremont was convinced he'd found the ideal guide. He knows the land, and that's what attracts Fremont to him, and vice versa. Fremont is a romantic and uh, lover of nature. Carson had a real sense of duty and loyalty and devotion to John C. Fremont. I don't think he had a sense of duty to American expansionism. Carson was a very pragmatic, very humble, very steady guy. He had great judgment and uh, a sort of education that was hard won over many winters as a trapper. He understood all sorts of practical things that Fremont had no idea uh, about. He could give cool advice when you come across an Indian tribe. You know, how should you act? If you want to try to figure out where water might be, or also how to read signs, how to get from here to there over a mountain pass, Carson's a person you want to ask. One of the things that Carson did during one of the expeditions with Fremont was they encountered some uh, Hispanic uh, wayfarers who had had their horses stolen from them. The New Mexicans have been attacked by Indians and uh, the kind of mindset of the frontiersman was that you didn't allow this kind of behavior to go on, that you had to make a statement. Rather spontaneously, Carson decides to pursue these Indian horse thieves. The Indians were a large group, but nevertheless, Carson and his companion snuck up on the band, killed several of them, retrieved all the horses, brought back the horses, and several Indian scalps to Fremont's camp. This really impressed Fremont. Carson risking his life for a complete stranger. Uh, and this is really where the myth of, of Kit Carson um, as this great sort of white avenger um, on, the, on the trail uh, got its start. 
Thanks in large part to Carson, Fremont would come to be known as the Pathfinder, the man responsible for mapping the entire length of the Oregon Trail, a great American explorer on the order of Lewis and Clark. Fremont returned the favor. In August 1844, he had his expedition reports bound into a single volume and published in Washington, D.C. And on nearly every page, he lavished praise upon his trusty scout. Mounted on a fine horse, without a saddle, and scouring bareheaded over the prairies, he wrote in one typical passage, Kit was one of the finest pictures of a horseman I have ever seen. Carson became a great romantic figure as an explorer, as a guide, as a frontiersman, as an Indian fighter. In these books that were supposed to be reports, they were actually grand adventure tales. These books were bestsellers in their day and were used as handbooks by hundreds of thousands of people going west. Immigrants would be in their wagons holding that and it would say, this is where you're going to find fresh water. This is where there's going to be grass where you can graze your cattle. It was really uh, the first uh, map of its kind in America. Native people and mountain men had long known the way across the vast western wilderness. Now, most of America knew it too. In July 1844, Carson rode into Taos, weary from his travels with Fremont and ready to settle down with the girl he'd come to love. The youngest daughter of a prominent New Mexican family, she was petite and raven-haired. A beauty, said one observer, of the haughty, heartbreaking kind. Her name was Josefa, but Carson called her Josefita, or sometimes Little Joe. She was 18 years Carson's junior. You know, Carson was not exactly winning any beauty contests, but he clearly had some sort of charm and charisma if he was able to win her over. The wedding had been celebrated 17 months earlier, in February 1843, in the parish church in Taos. Carson had been away from home almost ever since. Now, he and Josefa were finally able to make a life together in their own little adobe house, not far from the town plaza. He truly married into this whole Hispanic life in Taos. He converted to the Catholic faith in order to please her family. They spoke Spanish in their household. Their kids spoke Spanish as their first language. You know, this, this, was, this was his world. Taos is a very special place. It's literally the hinge between Mexico and the U.S. It is Mexico's northernmost town. It is a traditional trading place for uh, indigenous peoples throughout the region. The Utes, Comanches, Apaches, Pueblo Indians. So this is a trading hub of the first magnitude. In the two decades since Carson first arrived, the bustling trade on the Santa Fe Trail had turned the place noisy and crowded. Scores of Americans already had put down roots in town, and more were coming all the time. With his mind on his young bride, Carson may have missed the meaning of all those new arrivals, but they had come to stay. And with the might of the American government behind them, they soon would make the West their own. It all happened more quickly than would later seem possible. When 1845 dawned, the western border of the United States was officially drawn at the Rocky Mountains. Except for Texas, which had declared its independence, and the as yet unclaimed Pacific Northwest, 
the remainder of the continent was officially Mexican territory. But due to the expansionist designs of President James K. Polk and a bloody war with Mexico that he provoked, by the late winter of 1847, the entire region, more than 500 million acres, was on the verge of becoming the property of the United States. It was a ball of land grab is essentially what it was during the Mexican War. The American army marched all the way from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to New Mexico. It conquered New Mexico. It kept on marching towards California. Carson happened to be in California that winter on yet another expedition with Fremont. And at Fremont's urging, had lent his assistance to the American forces there. In the field reports that were scribbled out during the course of the fighting, his name appeared again and again, describing how he had guided troops to San Diego, slipped through enemy lines to conduct vital messages, secured aid for several hundred soldiers under siege. As a reward for his valuable service, Carson now had been sent east with a thick packet of sealed letters for the Secretary of State and the War Department. The glowing accounts of his own battlefield heroism among them. When the United States conquered California, took it away from Mexico, they needed to get the news back. There was no telegraph or anything at that time. They wanted to get news across the entire continent of the United States. And the guy that they decided was the best to do it was Kit Carson. He arrived in Washington, D.C. in May 1847, some three months after he'd set out, having made the last leg of the journey by train. On the platform to meet him was Jesse Benton Fremont, wife of the nation's pathfinder and daughter to its most vocal champion, of manifest destiny. She had never laid eyes on Carson before, but she easily recognized him from the descriptions in her husband's expedition reports. It would be her honor, she told Carson, to act as his guide. But Carson found the capital bewildering, a welter of inscrutable signs and gawking strangers. He was outraged at having to pay for transportation and complained about it so bitterly that Jesse was moved to get him a horse. His room at the Benton mansion was stifling, and he soon quit the soft mattress there for a bedroll out on the veranda. But nothing put him at ease. It was almost like a Tarzan character had been dragged out of the jungle and brought into the city. He didn't really understand city life and had spent very little time in, in any sort of urban situation. Most of the time he's with Jesse Fremont. She introduced him to all these influential figures in Washington, and the people were fascinated by him. Everyone wants to meet Kit Carson, and that's because Kit Carson is the very living, breathing symbol of the American frontier and of our expansion westward. And of course, everyone wants to hear from his lips what the opportunities are for America in the West. Their schemes were ambitious, and to Carson's ears, a bit outlandish. They saw the western landscape transformed, its forests cleared, its valleys covered over with farms and towns. There was even talk of a railroad that would run clear across the continent. He's sort of amazed at the attitude of these men. He said, they're princes here in the east, but they would be nothing in the west. They would be completely helpless there. But here they put on such airs. You get a sense that Carson, as much as he hated it, he knew that it was important. These men had sponsored him and were sort of the agents of all of these changes that had come to the West. Carson was deferential towards men who were better connected and who were better educated than he was. And he felt a duty to respond to their inquiries in various ways. By the time he was ushered into the White House for a private audience with President Polk, Carson had only one objective, to get back to Taos and Josefa. Polk had other plans. He had some official dispatches to send to the U.S. commanders in California, and he wanted Carson to carry them. You know, he wasn't the kind of guy that said no. He's gonna, you know, he, he's got a job to do, he's gonna do it. Mm -hmm. 
Carson assumes a new role as a transcontinental courier, ferrying these messages back and forth from California to Washington. It's unbelievable when you think about how many tens of thousands of miles this guy covered. In many ways, Kit Carson was the field agent of Manifest Destiny. Before he finally returned to Taos, 16 months later, Carson's sense of duty would take him across the country four times and over some 16,000 miles, most of it on the back of a mule. Along the way, he would convey government reports and military orders and news of developments on the ground, all of it vital information that would bind the two sides of the country together and help to make the West an entirely different place. Kit Carson went to the West for the freedom and openness to escape from the constraints of society back home, back in the States. But then, of course, he brought it all with him. The dream of a continental nation has been met, and America stretches from sea to sea. The West is transformed, and he sees it all, but he's also one of the major instruments that brings about that change. By the late 1840s, Kit Carson, the hero of Fremont's best-selling expedition reports, was fast becoming a national obsession. It began, innocently enough, with stories told in taverns and names on a map. Then, in 1849, came a new literary hero, Kit Carson, the Prince of the Gold Hunters. A giant of a man who referred to Indians as redskins, critters, and varmints, and cheerfully slaughtered them by the dozen. Written by an East Coast hack who claimed it had been founded on actual facts, the book was a smash hit. Almost overnight, it became the template for a brand new genre of adventure stories. Hair-raising, action-packed, and set in the uncharted wilds of the Far West. Americans called them Blood and Thunders. These were atrocious books. I mean, they were just terrible to read. I would dare you to read them. But they were enormously popular in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. During the Civil War, they were read by Northerners and Southerners in the trenches. One theme that everyone could agree on, the American West and great plucky characters like Kit Carson. Rocky Mountain Kit's Last Scalp Hunt. Kit Carson's Bride. Kit Carson to the Rescue. Some 70 books would be written over the years to come, priced to sell at just 25 cents or less. They would seal Carson's reputation as a hunter, avenger, killer, whose exploits helped clear the way for civilization. These popular romances are unabashedly about killing Indians. The ones featuring Kit Carson have him riding into a camp, breeding 20 hostile savages, dispatching all of them and scalping them and riding out with his scalps dangling from his saddle. In the mood of the day, this was heroic. They had made no attempt to understand the real Kit Carson. They had not gotten his consent to use his name. They certainly didn't pay him any money. And uh, the final irony of, of the Blood and Thunders was that Carson couldn't read them because he was illiterate. Of course, the fictional Carson bore almost no resemblance to the real one. As a stranger once put it, after being told that the small man before him was the legendary Kit Carson, you ain't the kind of Kit Carson I'm looking for. Kit Carson just was who he was, and other people projected onto him their own beliefs, their own myths. And in that respect, I think he is like the West itself. It's a real place. There were real things that happened. And they were fascinating, dramatic, tragic. But that wasn't quite enough for us as a society. We had to twist it and mythologize it, and sometimes distort it completely out of context. Kit Carson was the greatest living symbol of that desire 
that Americans had to mythologize the West and take real things and turn them into something else. Throughout Carson's life, he doesn't linger anywhere, really. He's always on the move. He seems to be constitutionally incapable of saying no to these various missions that are laid at his feet. But the central theme in his life is always that he wants to get back to New Mexico and get back to Josefa and live this sort of normal existence that he imagines um, for himself. By the close of 1848, Carson was home in New Mexico, the last of his courier missions finally behind him. In six years of marriage, he and Josefa had so far lived together fewer than six months. With their first child now on the way, Carson had partnered with a fellow ex-trapper and launched a cattle operation in the Rayado Valley, some 50 miles east of Taos. Like settlers all over New Mexico, they were treading on contested ground. We tend to see maps of that area of New Mexico. And we see, of course, the American settlements. And we draw lines, and the rest is just Indian territory. We don't know what's in there. In fact, a more realistic map of that area would see very large, very powerful, very stable Indian nations. And even though these nations were nomadic, they had clearly formed territories. And whenever somebody trespassed, they were punished. Carson had spent too many years among native peoples to be daunted. We had been leading a roving life long enough, he later remembered. And now was the time, if ever, to make a home for ourselves and our children. Then, one afternoon in late October 1849, Army Major William Greer came tearing up to the ranch to ask Carson for help. A few weeks before, a Missouri trader named James White had been heading west on the nearby Santa Fe Trail with his wife Anne and their infant daughter when their party had been attacked by Indians. White had been killed, Anne and the child taken captive. In the days since, the captured woman and her baby had been spotted in a Hickoria Apache encampment, out on the plains, somewhere east of the trail. Greer figured if anyone could find them, it was Carson. Kit Carson understood the Hickory Apaches quite well, spoke their language, uh, and he was a likely candidate for this, uh, for this job. So he begins to pursue them east towards Texas. He was accompanied by a group of soldiers. They chased the Hickory Apache for something like 12 days. It was the most difficult trail I ever followed, Carson later said. In nearly every camp, we would find some of Mrs. White's clothing, which was the cause of renewed energy on our part to continue the pursuit. Finally, late on the twelfth day, Carson saw plumes of smoke curling skyward in the distance, the cooking fires of a large Hickoria Apache camp. There's a disagreement about how to approach the Hickorias. Some within the party hope that uh, they can negotiate with them. Carson believes they should attack immediately. Uh, in the confusion, however, uh, the, the Hickoria Apaches spot the party and uh, scatter. Greer ordered the men to charge, Carson remembered. But the order was too late for the desired effect. In about 200 yards, the body of Mrs. White was found. Perfectly warm. Had not been killed more than five minutes, 
shot through the heart with an arrow. Later, sorting through what remained of the camp, one of Greer's men came across a book, which presumably had belonged to Mrs. White. A copy of the wildly popular Blood and Thunder, Kit Carson, the Prince of the Gold Hunters. Of course, Carson couldn't read it. He had to have someone else read it to him. But it, it was extraordinary because in this book, Kit Carson was assigned the task of rescuing a woman who'd been kidnapped by Indians. Um, and here he was, given the task of saving this woman. But in this case, in the real situation, um, he'd failed and she had died. And uh, he felt perhaps that this, uh, this book had given Anne White some sort of false hope that she would be rescued, that Kit Carson was near. The myth of the West came head to head with the reality of the West in that moment. And Kit Carson was just stunned by that experience. And he never got over, never got over the incident. Uh, and it haunted him all the rest of his days. Things might have been different if James and Anne White had been the last or the only. But there were two among tens of thousands, a tiny drop in the massive migratory wave that was then rolling westward and swamping everything in its path. Carson could trace the start of it back to the discovery of gold in California, news of which he is thought to have carried on one of his courier missions east. In 1849 alone, some 100,000 Americans had set out for California. And as the traffic on the trails increased, so too did the clashes between settlers and Indians. Inevitably, Carson was called upon to help mediate those conflicts. And in 1853, he accepted a position as an Indian agent for the Northern New Mexico Territory. I'm sure part of his calculation was that he would moderate whatever destructive impulses the U.S. may have had towards these groups. So part of his calculation, I'm sure, is that, well, I better do it rather than somebody else. For an annual salary of $1,550, he would now serve as the U.S. government's official representative in its dealings with the Moach Utes, a band of nomadic hunters that New Mexican officials had branded the most difficult to manage in the territory. Day after day, Carson listened to the Utes grievances, lodged complaints on their behalf, smoked and talked with them. He grew especially fond of a chief named Kaniche, who would prove a lifelong friend. The Utes called Carson Father Kit, and they, they loved him uh, by all accounts. He was fair-minded and honest, and began to really do the very tough work of thinking about Indian policy. What are we doing to the lives of these tribes? He was a better Indian agent than most of the other people at the time because he actually knew the Indians. A lot of times they were political appointees, people with connections. Sometimes they were missionaries, come not necessarily just to understand the Indians, but to make them not Indians, to convert them. And Carson was not entirely unique, but he stands out. He's somebody who honestly tried to do what he thought was the best for them. By far the bulk of Carson's time was taken up with New Mexico's most persistent source of conflict, an ancient practice common to the Utes, the Navajos, and other native peoples known as raiding. This was part of their way of gaining resources. You would go out and raid because some of these settlements were exposed and because they had tangible resources that you could appropriate. There were women and children that could further your population expansion. All of these things came into play. These were very shrewd communities living in a very harsh environment. 
And so you had to do what you had to do. Carson considered raiding a grave threat to frontier security. And he knew from long experience that the Indians' own code of justice demanded retribution. But as the months and years passed, he began to see that many of the crimes blamed on Indians were in fact the fault of whites, newcomers who were settling on traditional hunting grounds and driving off all the game. When a Ute chief called Blanco was accused of robbing sheep, Carson reported that the Indian had had no other choice. If the government will not do something to save the Utes from starving, he argued, they will be obliged to steal. Here we have a world that had existed on its own for thousands of years. A world that is coming to an end because of a very rapidly growing American population. Carson came to see the moment white settlers outnumber indigenous people. Then it's very hard for these indigenous peoples to actually hold the line. He was alarmed. Everywhere he turned, he saw that the Indian populations were dwindling. He began to grapple in his own way, dictating hundreds and hundreds of letters. You begin to see a realization that many of the uh, uh, changes that he had set in motion were really changing the whole complexion of the West. No American, least of all Carson, believed that the nation's westward migration could be stopped. The government has but one alternative, he concluded, either to subsist and clothe the Indians or exterminate them. There are these incredible forces at work at this time. There is a nation intent on moving across the West as quickly and as decisively as possible. Kit Carson found himself incapable of stopping those larger forces, so he became an, an agent in, their, in the destruction of their way of life, though he was not an Indian hater in the, in the sense that a lot of Anglos of the mid-19th century were true racist Indian haters in the worst possible sense. That was not Kit Carson. His children are Indian and Hispanic. And he knows that they will carry that appellation in their life because of the blood that they carry. He deals easily with native peoples because he's just like them. That doesn't mean he's on their side. He's not. But it means he understands where they're coming from. On the day the army courier turned up with his orders to round up the Indians in the fall of 1862, Carson had just marked his one-year anniversary as commander of the first New Mexico Volunteers. He'd accepted the position during the early months of the Civil War, when a force of Texas cavalry rode into southern New Mexico and proclaimed the area Confederate territory. The Confederates had been easily turned back, and Carson hoped soon to be mustered out returned to Josefa and reinstated as an Indian agent. But events had conspired against him. While the New Mexican forces had been preoccupied with the Civil War, the Indians, especially the Mescalero Apaches and the Navajos, had stepped up their raiding. Over the previous year alone, more than 30,000 sheep had been stolen and some 300 people killed. Now, Carson had received an urgent dispatch from Brigadier General James Henry Carleton, ordering him to put the Indian troublemakers down, one tribe at a time, and once and for all. James Henry Carleton was a piece of work. He was a New England Calvinist, a man of a very tidy intellect. These were messy social problems, and he could not countenance th this sort of situation and believed with a great conviction that he could fix it almost overnight. 
Convinced the treaties had no lasting effect, Carleton planned the most comprehensive and most ruthless campaign never to have been carried out in the West. Carson and his men would make total war on the Indians. They would kill all the adult men on sight, take the women and children prisoner, and march them several hundred miles to the new reservation Carleton had established in the grasslands of eastern New Mexico, the Bosque Redondo. He wanted to force them overnight at gunpoint to become Christian farmers. He believed this was important, not only for their own good, but he believed this was a model for how to deal with all the nomadic tribes of the, of the West. He felt that he could solve this problem in New Mexico, this Indian problem. And Carlton turns to Carson, of course, because he's Kit Carson. Carson was 52 now and bone tired. And there was an odd pain in his chest that came and went without warning. He missed his wife and regretted that the four children they'd had together lately had seen so little of their father. But an order was an order, and Carson could not refuse. As he struggled to reconcile himself to another season away from his family, he called in his clerk and dictated a letter in Spanish to Josefa. Adora Esposa, he began. Do not worry about me, because with God's help, we shall see each other again. I charge you above all not to get weary of caring for my children and to give each one a little kiss in my name. I remain begging God that I return in good health to be with you until death. Your husband who loves you and wishes to see you more than to write to you. Four months later, Carson could report to Carleton that the first phase of the campaign had been accomplished. Although he'd quietly ignored the order to shoot the men on sight, he'd nevertheless managed to round up the Mescalero Apaches. And he asked that Carleton release him from his commission. He had not joined the U.S. Army to fight Indians. He joined to fight the Texans during the Civil War. And he said, if the Texans return, I'll put on a uniform again, but I need to go back to my wife and children. Josefa was pregnant again. Uh, he wanted to get back home to Taos. Carlton refused. He needed Carson to complete the campaign. No one else, he insisted, possessed Carson's peculiar skill and high courage. And no one else stood a chance against Carlton's next target the most formidable of all of New Mexico's native peoples, the Navajos. For nearly 500 years, they had lived on the ground bordered by the four sacred mountains. For 500 years, they had tended their flocks of sheep and cultivated their fields and orchards. And for 500 years, they had tangled continually with their neighbors, perpetuating the cycle of raid and retaliation that had made the New Mexico Territory infamous. They called themselves the Diné, but to the many who feared them, they were the Navajos. New Mexico was terrified of Navajo. They were warlike. This was a part of their culture, raiding, stealing, killing. They were formidable. They were dangerous and people were afraid of them. Carson lived in New Mexico his entire adult life and public enemy number one was the Navajo. 
everybody in New Mexico, every Hispanic person, had some friend or family member who had been killed by the Navajo or had been stolen by the Navajo. And I think he thought Carlton's idea of, of a reservation on the Pecos was as good as any that had been put forward as to how to end this cycle of violence. In early July 1863, Carson set off in the direction of Navajo country with a column of several hundred men, U.S. Army officers, New Mexican volunteers, and auxiliary troops recruited at Carson's request from among his former charges, the Utes, who were longtime and bitter tribal enemies of the Navajos. Kit Carson followed orders. That was part of how he had gotten to where he had gotten. Not questioning the society he was in, and he got there by taking orders and doing a good job of carrying them out. When Carlton told him, go take care of the Navajo for me, he was going to go do it. The colonel is after the Indians at full speed, one of Carson's men noted, and is determined to overtake them if horse flesh will stand it. In a typical scout, Carson pushed his men nearly 500 miles in 27 days, capturing over a thousand head of livestock, but pitifully few Navajos. He goes out into Navajo country and he, he doesn't see a soul. You know, he basically thinks this is a kind of like a ghost campaign against a, a ghost tribe. He's fighting uh, an enemy he can't see. Frustrated and eager to bring the campaign to a rapid conclusion, Carson made a fateful decision, one that would define him for generations to come. He could not get the Navajos to come out in the open battle. And so the thing to do is to destroy their source of uh, strength, you know, which is the food and their homes. And that's what he did. His tactics causes great suffering. He ordered every cornfield to be destroyed, every melon patch, every bean patch. Uh, he had his men guard the salt sources and the water sources and chop down every tree. It was brutal. This was not majestic, uh, heroic warfare, if there is such a thing. This was a dirty little war of, of attrition with the express intent of starving the Navajos out. He knew the Indians. He had known them from an early time as a mountain man. He probably knew Indians better than any other white man of his time. He knew what uh, they would stand and how they could be brought to terms with the army. And, uh, you know, he didn't hesitate, I think, to, to act on the basis of his knowledge. Carson later estimated that his men had destroyed nearly two million pounds of food. Come winter, he told Carlton, the loss will cause actual starvation and oblige the Navajos to accept emigration to the Bosque Redondo. For the moment, however, the Navajos remained maddeningly elusive. I deplore it the more, he complained to Carlton, as I now have only one way of communicating with them, through the barrels of my rifles. Summer gave way to fall, and the campaign ground on with little result. Finally, in November, on the eve of his 54th birthday, Carson requested a leave of absence to attend to what he called some private business of importance. Carlton would not hear of it. Carson would be permitted to leave the field only after he had captured 100 Navajos, and then only on the condition that he first conduct a thorough sweep of Canyon de Chez, a 100